Welcome to this morning's study. And before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? A dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for your goodness and love that's been manifest to us in the things that you provide, in the truths, in your word that give a light for our feet and that encourage us and for the relationships that we have with one another and with you and um, that show us that you are a God of love. We pray, Lord, that as we open your word together, your Holy Spirit will be here to guide and direct our minds. And in this world of confusion, Lord, we ask that you can give us clear understanding. Forgive us for our sins and help us to trust fully in you. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so good morning, everyone. Now, just uh, first things first. Um, I was talking about the number 23,111, and it's simply if you take Daniel 11.9 and you add the Hebrew numbers for the definitions of each of those words, it comes to 23,111. And the fact that it is 191 times 11 times 11 to get 23,111 gives us this indication that this is marking 9-11 and 11-9, so that fits perfectly with Daniel 11-9. Now, I just want to touch a little bit on uh, what it is that we are doing as far as using these numbers and symbols. So when you take something like this, um, and I don't know, this probably, this, so looking at this chart here, so, you know, we had taken these Hebrew numbers and we had seen that they refer to spans of time. Now, 23,111 is, we're not using it specifically as a span of time, right? If it was a span of time, it's going to be a period of 63 years and um, uh, what did I do wrong? Go back here. 63 years. There we go. And I can't remember the number of days that it was. 100, 100 days. So 63 years and 100 days. And, and I've said, well, what is what is that number? I mean, we know it, it has a symbol, 191 times 11 times 11. It comes from adding the Hebrew numbers of that verse. Um, but I don't know where we could place it. So uh, 63 years in our line, uh, I mean, that it doesn't fit in our line at all. It would be something outside of our specific line. And... Um, you know, so I thought, well, maybe if I could attach that to, uh, um, you know, different different people's birthdays or something, and, and and I couldn't find anything. So maybe somebody could figure out what that is. But 63 years and 100 days. Okay. Now, um, so sort of to step outside of this even a little bit further to sort of step back, I kind of have to tell you what what I'm going through. In, in my discussions with other people. So I did mention a guy uh, in, in when talking to other people, but a guy named Charlie Smith, who um, uh, has a completely different chronology of the Bible. And so, you know, I entered into conversation with him. And no matter what objective facts you would present, it's all part of a conspiracy. So there's a Persian conspiracy and a Greek conspiracy to change the to add an extra period of time whatever it is 56 years or something to the persian period and and it's and it's all based on this really uh tenuous idea of how he looks at uh cycles of seven so he has some ideas about these cycles of seven jubilee and sabbatical cycles and he has to have them end in 1992 right so finally, after talking to him for a few weeks, 
um, and learning quite a bit, you know, dealing with uh, some of the details that I've looked at before, the elephantine papyri and all these different um, uh, uh, astronomical diaries and so forth. You know, it finally comes that he's he's Jesus Christ. So, um, you know, so he's he's a little bit delusional. I would have to say maybe a lot delusional uh, to believe that he's Jesus Christ and that somehow I should accept that. So now he pointed me in direction of another guy. Well, just he had connected. He sent an email where he had this discussion and that I was having with him and he sent it to a bunch of other people. One of them is a guy named Doug Mason, who I've talked with before, seen his stuff on academia, and I think also have talked with him on Facebook. Now, he's on the side more of, like he wrote, this is a waste of time talking to Charlie Smith. Um, and I sort of agreed with him. But uh, he's on the side of the development of Christianity over time, more, more what I grew up with, you know, that the... The Old Testament is this collection of of stories uh, that develop over time. And by the time you get to, uh, you know, the, the Hasmonean period, you know, they've they've got the Old Testament into a sort of form that everybody kind of accepts. And then, of course, when you get to Christianity, that's that's not foreseen in the Old Testament at all. Um, you're just reading back into the Old Testament text things that aren't there. Right. So that that sort of idea. And then there's another guy I'm talking with. Uh, I think his name is George Gunn. And, and he wrote a really good paper on uh, the 70 weeks and, and sort of all the different views out there. Gives a really good and concise overview of, of the different issues and problems that happen in interpreting the 70 weeks. And then there's, of course, us. You know, we, we're... We're studying prophecy in some ways. You know, we could say we're not much different than Charlie Smith. I mean, we're not an individual who's saying we're Jesus Christ, but we're saying, you know, the scriptures are pointing to our time, to this movement, and to this time in earth history. And, and why should anyone believe us? Um, somebody looking at, at this from the outside could just say, well, you're using numbers from Strong's Dictionary to establish truth, right? That's pretty, pretty wild, wild-eyed stuff. I mean, what we're doing here. Um, and is this objective, or are we just reading into things from, you know, trying to sort of prove, prove our points? And you know, somebody looking at this from the outside could just say, you know, all these little discussions you're having in these different points of view, you're all just a bunch of nutcases anyway. Right. I mean, that's what people looking at from the outside could say. So to have this anchored in the way that we do, though, we know that it is not just that we're looking at these definitions, but other people can't really see that. Right. They don't know what we've gone through. They don't know the whole path that has led us to these conclusions. And but, you know. Charlie Smith could say that about us. You guys don't understand the whole path that led me to the conclusion that I'm Jesus Christ, right? You know, just, you know, if you understood what I understood, then you would, you would see this. Um, now, of course, I did read his material, so I know pretty much what he thinks, and I can see how none of it is is based on reality. Um, but ours is based on reality, and. And, and we can see that with the Millerites. The Millerites made predictions. So, you know, people will look at it like um, uh, Doug Mason. You know, he used to be an Adventist. He was an Adventist from uh, 1964 to 1982. And one of the reasons he left Adventism was, you know, he was more a liberal and he more sided with Desmond Ford. And so uh, when Desmond Ford had his credentials removed, it eventually led to uh, Doug Mason leaving Adventism. I don't know how old he is, so I'm not sure if 1964 is when he was born. Uh, probably not. Uh, he's probably maybe when he was baptized. I'm not certain. Um, but anyway, so he's definitely older than me, you know, if he was an Adventist in 1964, unless he was born in 1964. Um, 
But we see these people who are in the in the world because God has given us a mission to reach other people and and to give them the knowledge of God's character, to give a knowledge of God. And and people looking at, at our discussions could say, well, what are these people doing? I mean, what is this all about? We have all of these lines of prophecy, all of these dates, and we can sometimes lose sight of what this is about. That God is giving light to us because we need to understand the truth. Because we need to be able to face some very trying circumstances. And, and we need to know that we are, for lack of a better word, in the right, right? That we need to know that what we're doing is real and not some fantasy. Because we're going to be faced with choices that are going to be life and death choices. And yet, you know, we're subjective human beings, right? We, we need something objective. And, and to me personally, this is objective. This is chronology. This is mathematics. This is something very precise. When I was studying the book of Ezekiel and looking at the chronology and seeing that Ezekiel began his prophesying on the fifth day of the fourth month, which was July 21st on the Julian calendar in 592 BC, and that his last recorded vision in the book in chapter 40, verse 1, is October 22nd. Um, and it's also the 10th day of the seventh month. And I could relate that Ezekiel is connected to Millerite history. That was very powerful for me. But the question is, how do other people uh, look at what we're doing? Can that be uh, the message to Adventism? Now, when we look at Ezra 7 to 10, that's a little simpler because I don't need to know how to use, you know, convert the biblical calendar into anything. I can just lay out those biblical dates and I can lay them out in Millerite history fairly simply because we you know you just need to know a little bit about the biblical calendar. October 22nd is the 10th day of the seventh month in 1844. So that means April 19th must be the first day of the first month. And we can then figure out which is the fifth day of the fourth month and which is the first day of the fifth month. And we can line that up together. And I have shown it to, to Adventists who were able to accept it and recognize it right away, that this was strong evidence for our understanding. But we have to give a message to the world and the way that the church has and, and the Christianity has moved is that we move to these very emotional, subjective ways of looking at things. And there is there is a role for emotion, right? Could we say that there's a role for emotion? People are emotional creatures. Is there anything wrong to, yes. to make it? There is a role. God made us, made us that way. Yeah, he explains joy and anger and wrath and vengeance and everything in between. Yeah, and, and we're affected by emotions. Now, you know, and a lot of people, of course, make their decisions based completely upon emotions. But is they're not making their decision based upon something objective. It's just something subjective, something they feel. And, and you see this when people leave Adventism, you know, I always expect they're going to have some rationale or logic of why Adventism is incorrect, but it's usually some emotional thing. Either they have some hurt feelings, how they were treated in the church, or, uh, you know, some kind of an explanation about the, the problems with the church, or, and, and if they're going to use some kind of doctrinal thing, they'll say something about, you know, the investigative judgment, there's no evidence for it, and it display, display, you know, uh, displays God as being, you know, sort of this person always watching our actions and all, all these different things, views that people have about God. So, you know, the question is, and, and, and you know, it's maybe a little bit of a rhetorical question, 
But what is the use of what we're doing? Why why has God put us here at this time to look at this history this way? What is he trying to do for us? Is he trying to take us from this emotional world that's around us, that's our sight, our senses, you know, our feelings, and to ground us in something that's more real? But our numbers are real. He used it, 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 he used it to um, develop our character. Okay, so he brings us through an experience personally through these lines, right? So these lines mean something to us because we're part of them. Correct? Yes, we can see how God has worked in times past with folks who are just like us, really. And yeah. despite their frailties, he used them, and that's an encouragement for us. And also, when it really taxes, I know it taxes my mind to try to keep up with all this. And I figure that's really good discipline. Really good discipline. And you can see how God is leading. Palmoni is leading us. Yeah. And, but yet, you know, we know that, that, that in the end, it's not going to be all of these intellectual arguments that are going to win people. It's going to be the character of Christ in us that is going to draw men to Christ. Right? Amen. And how do we learn it? Through chastening. And I was told that chastening actually means child training. And why, why did John write, you know, my little children or you young men, or, you know, like he addressed people as being uh, learners. And that's yeah. what we are. That's what we must be. So so when we're looking at this and we're going through Daniel chapter 11, I mean, we're looking at objective history and we're line, lining up this history. We're, we're seeing that the Bible is true. It re represents some objective reality that these these aren't things written after the fact, you know, and and written to pretend that they're prophecy. You know, they're not written in the second century B.C. This is written in the time when Daniel was living. He wrote this right this is a prophecy from God. And, and we can start to see that as we go through and look at the details here. And then as we apply to our own life, God is giving us this light for our feet because we're involved in an experience with God. And, and it is a little bit, you know, we talked a bit before about the idea with, you know, Biden being the one that is. And that it seems a little bit narcissistic that here we are figuring this riddle out at the right time and other people aren't. So it's it's sort of like, well, who are we to have this experience at this time? Well, somebody has to, um, right? There has to be, at some point, people who represent Christ. And, you know, Heidi and I were talking about it last night, dealing with, um, and, and I think about the, we didn't talk about this specifically, but in, um, in early writings, there's those uh, chapters that we looked at before, uh, dealing with the first and second angel's message in our Friday night study when we started studying uh, the first, second, and third angel's messages, where, you know, this light comes and shines upon all of these people, and a few lights here and there respond. And when we follow God, there are people who are drawn to that, but there's also people who are going to oppose us. Right. So in our experience, when we choose to follow God and we develop a Christ like character, there are people who are going to hate us. They're going to persecute us. They're going to malign our characters. And of course, we give them lots of things to do that because we are human beings and we have defects in characters, maybe even in the past before we were converted or before we had a ex certain experience, and they can say, well, who are you? Um, so, so in all of this, God is the one who is glorified. God is his, his character. And so we're facing this battle, the spiritual battle between good and evil. And, and we see it in chapter 10, 
of Daniel, right? That's, that's what's going on. It's a battle in our hearts. And God has, um, God is dealing with us as if we are the only person on earth. He can focus his personal attention on each of us individually. He works in our lives in powerful ways. And the truths that he is showing us are meant to develop a Christ-like character in us. And if, if we're studying these things and all we're doing is, you know, trying to prove ourselves correct, um, we're never going to come to a knowledge of the truth. It's easy to find fault with others. It's much more difficult to address the evil that exists in our own hearts. And, and also to have a new understanding of God, to come closer to him, requires that the sins that we have clung to have to be discarded. So this is, is, this is not some intellectual game. So I, I mentioned that as we start to move into understanding Daniel 11, verse 11. So, so we, we've, we've passed verse 10. We say verse 10 is representing the Sunday law. And now in verse 11, we are, we are looking at this history and we're saying, well, this is Raphia. Now we also are saying that that Sunday law that, that's mentioned there is a type of the Sunday law. It's symbolized in our lines as December 25th, 2023. And, um, and um, so when we looked at this, we put it as the third angel arriving. And then January 20th, 2025, we have as the fourth angel arriving on our line, which is a repeat of history. And so now we have to address this Raphian Paneum in, in a bit more detail. We did an overview of it yesterday um, that, even though Uri Smith doesn't refer to Paneum uh, directly, but we, we know that this is Raffi and Paneum that are going to be addressed in this history. And on the lines that we have, we're going to say that this is midnight and the midnight cry, right? That's what Raffia and Paneum are. So I'm going to bring up here, let me see. So one of the things that I just searched my my charts and I, I, I was correct. I don't uh, let me see. Maybe I'm wrong. OK. Yeah. So so I have some charts and, and we're going to look at them here. So just going to my. Uh, my charts I have on my computer. So let's take a look at these. When I have addressed Raffia. Um, if you look at this chart, this chart's a little bit odd um, because what I have is I have 1989 and 1798 lined up together. So just one at the top. Oops. So. Okay. <clears throat> and then I have August 11th and 9-11 lined up. So that's 9-11 is the arrival of the first angel. And then I have April 19th and 9-11 lined up. That's 9-11 is the arrival of the second angel. And then I have midnight, which is the Sunday law, and the loud cry, which lines up with the midnight cry. And then I have Raphia lining up with the close of probation, which doesn't really make much sense. I mean, we would just say, how is Raphia the close of probation? So this is just the line that I made. So I don't know when I made this, but we would actually have to put Raphia here. So I'm just going to cut this out here. Um, get rid of that. Okay, so I'm going to put Raphia here. However, this is going to work. So we know that this is Raphia, right? Midnight. And then we would have Paneum over here. 
Okay. So, so we, um, I probably could have left the other one here, but okay. So let's just examine this. So we're, we're trying to understand how we understand these lines, why we have done what we've done. So when we look at this line, midnight, midnight cry, Sunday, last week, about 9-11 to the close of probation, normally we would place this as the Sunday law. Oh, hopefully it doesn't fuck up. Okay. So I'm going to go here. Oops, I shouldn't have a question there. There we go. Bad. Sunday. Okay, does this make sense to people? Let's discuss this. You got 9-11 to the Sunday law. Probably could have switched these around a little bit. But the loud cry, the loud cry comes after the Sunday law, doesn't it? Yes. Okay. So so why do I have the loud cry and the midnight cry lined up like that? What, what was I thinking when I was trying to do this? Does that one like parallel the loud cry with the midnight cry? I think I've read that, but I'm trying to figure out where. But then I'm thinking of the sleeping virgins. It was the midnight cry that awoke them, which would be a loud cry. Right. So she does parallel the loud cry with the midnight cry. It is they. So you would put the loud cry here rather than there. So, you know, so if we were going to take this, we would normally do this. So, I mean, I kind of know what I was doing. Because that was just like a worksheet that this is. But but we would look at this and we would say, well, this is the close of probation here. Is is obviously not the close of probation on the big line. This is just the close of probation for Seventh Day Adams. So even here, the close of probation is is not the close of probation that we would have on the big line. That is what we could see here. What I was doing is lining up. Um, these, so this is Rafi and Pidium. This is where I think they properly belong. And our history is in here. We're between 9-11 and midnight, right? So we haven't come to Rafi yet. We have, um, Rafi is midnight, and that parallels in Millerite history with midnight, midnight cry, Rafi and Pidium, Boston and Exeter. And then we have here the Sunday law. So in this line, all of this history, if we go from, ignore this top part, because this is Millerite history. But if, if we take this in our line, we can see that it's a repeat of Millerite history. And there is a close of probation in Millerite history. April 19th, Boston, Exeter, close of probation. In ours, it's 9-11, midnight. And I cry Sunday law. So we're lining up with Millerite history. But Ellen White lines up the loud cry, which happens after the Sunday law, with the midnight cry, right? And so we've discussed this when we were going through uh, the book of Judges, that this, this problem that we have is simply that the first and second angel's messages are repeated the Sunday law represents a close of probation for Seventh-day Adventists. But also the midnight cry and the loud cry parallel each other. So that means this repeat of history here is, is a repeat of history. It's not the history of, it's not the repeat of history. It's a repeat of history. But when we get to the loud cry, that's also a repeat of history. That is, this midnight cry typifies this loud cry just as the midnight cry in Millerite history typifies this loud cry, which means that the Sunday law lines up with midnight, right? That's why I had the Sunday law there with midnight, because Raphia, you know, we would have to say in Millerite history, if we're going to line midnight up with this line here, we have to say that midnight, if we take this line and zoom it up, 
midnight, followed by the midnight cry. Sunday law, followed by the loud cry. So that means we can line up the loud cry with the midnight cry, and we can line up the Sunday law with midnight. So in our history, we do have a Sunday law that lines up with raffia. We do have a midnight cry, which is the loud cry that lines up with Panean. Is that too confusing for people? Not if you're choosing to study. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think it, I think it should be clear to us now that when we have wheels within wheels, when we zoom into a way mark, and what we would say is our history is a zoom into the Sunday law. So this Sunday law is the Sunday law on Alan White's line, what we call the national Sunday law, followed by the loud cry. Right. This is that history. And yet we're repeating history. And so we have to go through an experience that parallels the Millerites to their close of probation. So in this context, this Sunday law is also a close of probation. But it's not that close of probation because you're going to have the loud cry and then you'll have the close of probation. Right. So this is just a close of probation for Seventh-day Adventists, because Seventh-day Adventists who know the truth, and fail in that Sunday law test are not going to have some other opportunity to pass that test later, right? Because they've already developed a character that's going to be demonstrated in a crisis. They're not going to all of a sudden develop a character later that's going to allow them to to continue on. They have made their choice. Now, there are some Seventh-day Adventists who don't have light, and... They may initially, you know, stumble at this Sunday law, but, you know, God will give them light, anybody who's searching for light, and allow them to pass that test. But this isn't so much about individuals. This is really more about a major line represents uh, general principles of what's happening. So as individuals, there may be exceptions to these things that we don't fully understand. But as far as a movement is concerned, as far as a church is concerned, Seventh-day Adventists cannot safely fail the Sunday law test. And prior to the Sunday law test, they're going to have the image of the beast test. So they're going to have this knowledge about what's happening, and they're going to be siding with the enemy, right? They're going to fail that test. And and so we need a knowledge to pass that test. Now, that knowledge is not just mathematics. It's not just chronology. It's an experience that we have gone through that prepares us for that time. That is, we can see ourselves as sinners and we aren't justifying our actions so that we can somehow just appear good in our own eyes. And and one of the things about the world, which is Christianity, which is Adventism, is that people believe that if they look good in the eyes of others, even if they're not good, that somehow that can also fool God. So many people are concerned, not about what God says, but what man says. That if man says that they're okay, then God obviously must also be fooled. Right? You understand what I'm talking about? Yes, I mean, my landlord used to get all all this stuff from the SBA church. And I would flip through it and I'd say, all they're doing is praising themselves. Like there is nothing here that really feeds the soul. Yeah, it's like the 1901 General Conference, where uh, if you read the General Conference Bulletin, you have them, you know, all patting themselves on the back of how wonderful the church is and how much it's accomplished and our missions and how, you know, God is using us. And Ellen White gets up and says, you guys have totally departed from what God wants you to do. We need a reorganization. You know, um, so people can believe that they're doing good uh, when they're not. Um, This reminds me a little bit of of the camp meeting back in 2016, um, where uh, I remember there was, you know, the reports from the mission field. So there were some people who reported about what was happening in Africa, 
and in Europe and so forth. And um, Tabo went up and presented what was happening in Canada. And everything that he said was a complete fabrication. I mean, Canada was not in good shape in 2016, uh, the work that was being done there, right? But he was basically trying to pat himself on the back of what a wonderful work that he was doing. And now, and, and when I mentioned to some people that, uh, you know, that's not what's happening in Canada, um, you know, they were quite upset with me. But, um, but the reality was, is that the work in Canada was very divided in 2016. Sure, we had, and it wasn't growing. I mean, it was actually shrinking from the people that we had had uh, earlier. So the movement was much healthier uh, back in 2012 than it was in 2016. So um, anyway, the point is that we can pat ourselves on the back. We can, we can think we're doing good and we can try to fool ourselves and fool others, but we can't fool God. And so God is bringing us through an experience to expose to us who we are so that we can change. But it will also manifest his character in reality to the world. That is, people aren't going to see a bunch of phony people who are just pretending to be knowledgeable and wonderful. Those that are interested in truth will see Christ in the work. So that it's not going to be so much by an intellectual argument that people are going to be one to Christ in the loud cry, but because of the character of Christ that is seen upon his people. And we don't have that character, right? We're not prepared to do the work that God wants us to do. And God is preparing us. And he's preparing us in a three-step prophetic message, the everlasting gospel, in which he develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers. And we have to know that the side that we want to be on has a cross attached to it, and that it is going to expose to us individually our greatest weaknesses, our deepest and darkest sins that we are going to have to forsake. And it's not going to help us by focusing focusing upon other people's sins and weaknesses because we can't do anything about that. Also, it will deceive us into thinking that we are better than we are. If we focus upon Christ, we're going to see ourselves in the true light of God's character. If we focus upon others and see their sins, we can delude ourselves into thinking we, be, we are better than we are, right? And if we just focus upon ourselves and our own character, we can just imagine, you know, that we're good, right? And we're never going to go higher than than what we behold. Okay, so now when we get to Rafi and Panim, we know that we're approaching these waymarks. Between the midnight, midnight and the midnight cry is the joining of the two sticks. According to Jeff, what is it that happens between midnight and the midnight cry in the joining of the two sticks? What is the joining of the two sticks? The unification of Israel. Okay, right. So that means you have... The two sticks are the two 2520s, right? Correct. And those 2520s are overlapped. And in Millerite history, those two sticks were supposed to be joined, right? There is a three-step testing prophetic message that was to bring together this reformation that would bring about the second coming of Christ. But we had prophecies also that showed that this two-horned beast, this power in the United States, would have horns like a lamb, but it would speak as a dragon. And the first horn fell in Millerite history. In our history, the second horn uh, falls, that is Republicanism. Right? So we had Protestantism fall in Millerite history, Republican, the second horn falling in our history. 
And Jeff has been writing about this in some of his papers. Um, but uh, we know that in our history, Protestantism is also going to have a deeper fall, a, a fall that is its its moral fall has progressed to the point that you know it, it falls again, right? And and we can see that within Protestant Christianity. It's really that's when we talk about the daughter of the king of the south comes to the king of the north, right? That is that spiritualistic Christianity that is it's it's pure paganism. And, and it's even more deceptive than Catholicism in that sense, because it appears to be Protestant. It appears to be the truth, but yet it is it is error. And so we're living in that time. And the Republican horn is falling or has fallen. I'm not sure exactly how to place it. But when that when this becomes evident in this truth, what's happening in the world, those true Protestants are going to join with the true Seventh-day Adventists in opposing what's coming. It's not just at the Sunday Law that this happens. This happens prior to the Sunday Law, between midnight and the midnight cry, according to Jeff, that the image of the beast is forming, and those that are true to Christ will recognize it. But many people will worship the beast and his image, and this will lead to the Sunday Law. So this is this is this history that's still future. And for us right now, it's a little bit abstract to know exactly. We don't know all the details about how that's going to unfold. And we've looked at different types of scenarios of how that could possibly unfold. But we I know. Just, uh, yeah. Stephen. You know, how does just what you said there fit in with the railroad vision, vision that Ellen White had? where she okay. sees the church totally decimated and then they choose leaders amongst themselves and they begin to rise. So it looks as if the church is totally. Yeah. The so or, that would be that the Sunday law would uh, anticipate would do that. And then they rise up. Those who after, after the main leadership kind of dissipates mm -hmm. and then they choose leaders. So to me, that looks like as if, that's the Sunday law. The church is purified. Yes. And, so, then, uh, and then they can do a work with the joining of the two sticks. The joining of the two sticks doesn't happen before that. Okay. So good point. So Ellen White is going to place this all at the Sunday law. She's not going to have a midnight and a midnight cry preceding the Sunday law, correct? Yes. Okay. So we know in her understanding of the Sunday law, it doesn't have the details that we have, right? It doesn't have 9-11, midnight, midnight, cry, Sunday morning. Because this is a repeat of history. She hints at it with saying that the first and second angel's messages are to be repeated, or the parable of the ten virgins is going to be repeated to the very letter, which is the first and second angel's messages, right? And, mm -hmm. and we see that when she's talking about the Sunday law, She's talking about it in a broader sense than we are, right? So we know the midnight cry and the loud cry parallel each other. But this midnight cry here is obviously not really the loud cry on the big line, right? It's something that precedes the symptom. So it, it's, it's a very good question to understand this, um, that Ellen White sees this all as one sort of thing. But we can see as we've approached the Sunday law that this detail is brought out. So, so we know that those people have to stand with us at the Sunday law. So our Sunday law is, is a little more narrowly focused than Ellen White's Sunday law is. Is, is that acceptable to people? Would you say it's more narrowly focused or it's more refined? Okay, more refined, maybe. I'm just saying the point of the Sunday Law, we have as a very specific point with this other history preceding 
Ellen White doesn't have that other history preceding it. She just calls it all the Sunday law, right? Because we've been in the Sunday law since 9-11. Well, I have, a, I have an odd question that might help us understand this with Rafi and Paniam a little more clearly. Okay. As I was being led to prepare some other items, I ran across manuscript 39 of 1906, which you can also find in, supposed to be able to find in 20th manuscript release, pages 14 to 15. You said 1906? Right. Manuscript 39, 1906. Now, in this situation with Rafi and Paniam, are we seeing the opening of the fifth seal of Revelation 6? Well, my initial response would say no. Okay. And I'm I'm asking this because when when you find this, when you look at this in paragraph three. Okay. So nineteen oh six. Manuscript 39, 1906. Right. Pair, the seal was opened, John the Revelator, in vision, saw beneath the altar the company that were slain for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. So I'm just going to blow this up and share the screen. <clears throat> After this came the scenes described in the 18th of Revelation. When those who are faithful and true are called out from Babylon. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen. So, we're, so she's connecting here. The fifth seal was opened, and she sees, uh, or John sees, those that are um, slain for the word of God and his testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, we know that that's the how long question. How long, O oh Lord, you know, until thou avenge us, right? Right. So, um, um, right. Um, and white, right, white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said on, unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Right. So we know that this is those that are persecuted in the period of the Dark Ages, the 1260 years, right? We recognize that, yes. But is this being repeated in our time? Yeah. So so then what we do is we say, here Ellen White is going to be uh, referring to this, and she's going to be talking about the Sunday Sabbath issue. Um. So she says, when the fifth seal was opened, John the Revelator in vision saw beneath the altar the company that were slain for the word of God and testimony of Jesus Christ. After this came scenes described in the 18th of Revelation. So, so you're saying, well, how, how does that even connect? She's connecting chapter 6 with chapter 18. So you're saying that she's describing a repeat of history. I'm, right? I'm asking because, you know, our understanding has been that this fifth seal was being opened during the 42 months of papal supremacy. Now, is this being closed just before the empowerment of the third angel's message as described in Revelation 18? Okay. So, but when we look here at Revelation 6, so we know that Revelation 6 
is before Revelation 7, right? And right. This, in this section, so this is going to be going through this history. The seven seals are primarily addressing, um, well, it would be the history of the apostate church or the connection with apostate Christianity, what it's doing. Because the messages to the seven churches are addressing messages to to God's people through that period of time. Right? So maybe we'd say more internal. And Revelation 6 is addressing the external, the persecution that is happening. That's the simplification, but we would say that's basically what's happening. Right? And these are going to be symbols and events. And we know that there's going to be, you know, the sixth seal, which is going to have the Lisbon earthquake, uh, the dark day, um, um, and then the falling of the stars, right? So, so that's going to be after the fifth seal. And then, and then we're going to have, um, you know, the, the heavens departed as a scroll rolled together. Um, this is going to point us to, uh, these events, the final events in Earth's history. And then the question is asked, you know, who shall be able to stand? And then you're going to have chapter 7, which is going to address the sealing of the 144,000. It's answering the question, who's going to be able to stand? And and then you're going to see also the great multitude, all those that are saved out of all all ages, right, standing with the 144,000. And then... Revelation 8, verse 1, and when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about the space of half an hour. Now, this is referring to the investigative judgment. And so this is bringing us to October 22nd, 1844. So now we can see that there is some parallel between this history and our history, because we know all prophecies come and uh, apply at the end of time. So, so we're not saying, you're, and you're not suggesting that, you know, we would apply these chapter six to our time. You're just saying that there's a parallel of history. Yeah. And that history is personal. Right? We, we have been making the point that many of the things that we've been studying have a beginning and an ending. Yeah. Now the fifth, the fifth seal is open and it reveals some truth. And then we have the sixth seal and we have the seventh seal. So we can't say the, six, the fifth seal, you know, just goes to our time. It's a specific period of time in the past, but it can relate to our time. Okay. Right. Now, so if we have the, um, that history of Millerite history is going to be the sixth seal, right? I mean, just in the, the broadest sense. It's going to start, of course, with the Lisbon earthquake and, and, and move through that. But it's really about signs in uh, Millerite history that Ellen White calls uh, harbingers, right? These these signs in the sun and the moon and the stars. Right. Earthquake, right? Those are all are pointing to, they're pointing to the end of the 1260 and uh, the end of the 2520 for Northern Israel, for, for the false prophet, and, and bringing us to Millerite history. And then the seventh seal brings us to October 22nd, 1844. So eight verse one really shouldn't be a part of chapter eight at all. It should be a part of chapter seven. But, you know, at least that's where I would put it. This kind of makes it seem like all this other stuff is part of this uh, seventh seal, but it's not, right? All these things that are going to happen with the seven trumpets. Because uh, those are going to go back and repeat that history in dealing with Rome. Okay. So now we get to Revelation 18. So this is the revelation of the character of Christ in the last days. This is the Sunday law. And, and we know that this is a, a repeat of the second angel's message of Revelation 14, which is in Millerite history. Right? Correct. So, um, so if we go back to Ellen White's statement now, so here we have those that were slain for the word of God 
and they're going to ask this question. They're going to ask the question, how long? And then you're going to see the sixth seal, right? They have to rest. You see the sixth seal. You see Millerite history. You see the beginning of the investigative judgment. And then Ellen White's, so the, the people, the 144,000 in chapter seven, uh, they're going to be these people involved in Revelation 18, right? It's the, when the earth is lightened with the glory of the character of Christ in Revelation 18, it's because the 144,000 are doing that, right? They're revealing um, the earth being lightened with his glory is in his people, right? Okay. Okay. So that's why I would think she connects the two. But I don't think she's particularly saying that the fifth seal, we, we can, we can put the fifth seal in our history, right? In that direct way. It's just, this is, this is all connected. What, what happens in the fifth seal, those that were persecuted, we know that the papacy is going to rise again at the end, right? It's going to have a resurrection in our history. And that those people that metaphorically are told to rest a little and and that they have to wait until those others are going to be persecuted. Now we're going to see this happen under the angel of Revelation 18, right? That is going to be an answer to that question. Okay, so now you're asking this, of course, in relation to Stephen's question. His question has to do with the joining of the two sticks, where I was placing it, um, where Jeff places it, but I'm placing it there with Jeff. Because this, this to me was a fundamental, when because this is back 2015 when I asked Jeff this question. And, uh, and he responded with, you know, and I can't remember if the question was, uh, that I asked him was, when is the joining of the two sticks? Or when was the image of the beast formed or something like that? But I think, I think the question was, when is the, when is the joining of the two sticks? And he says, between midnight and the midnight cry. So that's what he answered. And, and so I came to understand the significance of what that means in that we have the Protestants who are going to join during the time of this in, image of the beast, because he puts the image of the beast test there prior to the Sunday book, more in connection with the midnight cry, but midnight and the midnight cry are really the same way, Mark, right? They're just separated out. Um, because we have Protestants who join with us in the Sunday law. Now, Ellen White puts the Sunday law and then the Protestants joining us in the loud cry, right, Stephen? That would be my understanding. Yeah. And, and that's how she does it. Um, that's my, that's always been my understanding as well. But as we zoom into our history, we can start to see that this, the, the details are brought out. Now, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be many Protestants under the loud cry, you know, after the Sunday law is enacted, who will make a stand throughout the world. But, when it comes to our understanding of how this history is unfolding, there are a, there's this repeat of history that that is connected to the Sunday law, right? That is 9-11 to the Sunday law is really all the Sunday. Law. It's the arrival of the second angel. But it's just more detail to it. Um, so when it comes to Dwight, when it comes to what you were saying, how were you trying to fit that, that in? If I can get your thoughts again, dealing with the fifth, the fifth seal and uh, Revelation 18, how would you then fit that in and what we've discussed? Well, with what with what we're looking at here, we we know that the two sticks are to be joined, but we also have a a parallel that we're addressing because what we were putting up on that on that chart with the loud cry the midnight cry 
we know that this is going to be followed soon after by those that are shown that there has been a um, a type of a know, thinking of the word where people have have entered into a spiritual type of I want to say unity, but that's not what I'm what I'm looking for. Where they've gone into a league. Okay. And they are now rejecting this league. The Protestants have been in league with Rome and have not fully recognized it. Yet at the at the Sunday Law, they're going to see that a league has been made that should not ever have been made. Now, we were able to see this because when when we start looking at the league's that Israel was making with Rome, with making this league with the nations around them. We know that this was forbidden by God. Right? Mm -hmm. So we come from midnight, which is symbolized by 217, and we come to the league which is also symbolized by 158. Yeah. Now, when I read this this morning about the fifth seal, and I'm seeing that Mrs. White is very clear about this on the fifth seal, and she then says in English, after this came the scenes described in the 18th of Revelation. Yeah. So I'm asking is this portion of the vision preceding what we see in the 18th of Revelation so that we know that one is following the other and I'm all I'm all I'm asking is if, if this is a close because we know that there is going to be some under the empowerment of the third angel's message that will be put to death. Wasn't she clear on that point? Yeah. Well, and so it's an answer to the question of how long. Right. Agreed. Is being answered with the angel of Revelation 18. Is that, so that, that should make sense. Now, the other thing, just to remind us about the 158, um, we know that that league, we connected it in 1493 to the league made with the Rechabites, right? Okay, agreed. And because that's 1,335 years, we get to 158. And then we count 666 years, and we begin the 1335 that ends in 1843, right? Okay. So, which was a really amazing feature of our chronology that that, that occurred and that we found right. this in, of, um, of Joshua, right? You're studying Joshua. So, um, <clears throat> so just, just dealing with this idea of this league, because that's what you're, you're bringing up. There's this, this league that Protestants have made with Rome and that these people are going to break that league in order to join with God's commandment keeping people. Right. Right. So, um, and then connecting that to, uh, the angel of revelation or not the, to, uh, not the angel, but the, the seal of revelation five, the fifth seal. Right. Um, there's this question in, in response, how long? Because we know that 
you're coming to the end of the 1260, this time of papal persecution. And in Millerite history, we should have we should have everything wrap up, but it's not going to, right? It's going to be extended. So they just have to rest. And and then that answer to that question, that those people that are going to be persecuted, we know persecutions are going to happen in this time prior to the Sunday, right? But also after the Sunday, right? Persecution is going to grow and expand in that period of time. By the time we get to the death decree after the close of probation in the time of the sixth seal, you know, we're going to have, um, I don't know if this, yeah, the, yeah, so the, I'm not sure what, the, the sixth, um, the sixth plague, I don't know what, the sixth plague in the time of the sixth plague, we're going to have, um, you know, the death decree. That's the time of Jacob's trouble, right? So we're going to have, Persecution continue to expand through this history. Now, in some ways, we're experiencing persecution internally right now in the movement. And, but, you know, this is just going to get worse. You know, so when a message is going to Adventism, there's going to be a lot of persecution. There's going to be a lot of crosses to bear. Um, and the experience that we're developing right now is going to be absolutely essential to be able to stand in those times, right? We're not, we can't be who we are right now, you know, in a year or two from now or three years or whatever it is. Um, we have to, we have to be different people than we are because we're not going to be able to stand as we are. And so that's why we're going through this experience. But I don't know if, we, you know, we answered all the, the questions that Stephen has in regard to this, but. Um, we now need to get into. Daniel chapter 11. And, and really, so, I mean, all these preambles, I think, are important in understanding what it is we're studying. Because we're studying history in the past and how it's parallel to our time. So let's, let's just look at Daniel chapter 11. The king of the south shall be moved with choler. This is anger. The king of the south is who? In our time. Well, the UN for one. Okay. So or, this is the, or the Democrats. Yeah. So this is the world. This is this enemy that is um, now. Now we already say, you know, the Democrats have conquered the United States, and you know, and then we're going to have a Republican response, and that's going to be the Battle of of Raffi and Pania, right? So we can look back. But we're saying that this is still future. So this has to be something on a much larger scale. In and in a way that um, isn't just about nations. This is about spiritualism. These are about the three parts of Babylon. And and so I'm suggesting that this this king of the south conquering the king of the north is it can't be just characterized by battles between Russia and the U.S. That it's actually much more on the scale of, of, of cosmic scale than that. And so, so neither of these are, you know, these aren't, you know, a good and a bad, right? This is not the great controversy between good and evil. So the king of the north, the king of the north includes Protestantism, that is the false prophet. So this would be a battle between everything that the king of the south represents, atheism, and everything the false prophet, prophet represents, which is apostate Protestantism. So if we, if we took it in this way, what is the battle of Raphia? 
that that's coming. What is coming on the world? Would it be World War Three? Okay. See, this is the thing that I think we have to avoid. So this is just me putting something out there. Is that we think that these battles, this King of the South and the King of the North, are something about like military conflicts. But I'm saying that this is something different than a military conflict. But this is more cosmic in scale. Uh, is it not uh, giving power to the to the beast? Okay, so uh, one of the yeah the way the way that I see Rome fighting, it's uh, it's not physical. So if we just think about secularism in 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 general, right? We see that there's a battle between the secular world and the religious world. And and that uh, what would be depicted here is this conflict between what we would call secular and what we would call religious. The religious is not the true religion. But we know that if the Sunday law is going to come, that, that somehow... A religion, it's, it's a religious Sunday law. It's not a secular Sunday, right? It's not something put up by the unions to have one day off for family. It's not an environmental Sunday law to, you know, uh, ha- cause less consumption by having people take one day off in the week, right? That is is a religious Sunday law for religious reasons. And it has to be worldwide. That is, the world needs to embrace this Sunday law. And so we're looking for a crisis that isn't just a military or an economic crisis. And I'm not saying that those don't exist. We're looking at a crisis that I believe is developing in the world today. And that is 20 years ago, if you were, you know, and of course we didn't really have the internet then, but, you know, we had the media. Um, You don't have the world talking about God. Is the world talking about God more openly today than they were 20 years ago? Do celebrities talk about God? Yes. Yeah, okay. They didn't 20 years ago, right? Celebrities even talk about Jesus, right? We've seen a change in the world. As the world is getting worse morally, And as Christianity is becoming more and more liberal, the difference between the world and the church is disappearing. Right? And yet there is a battleground being fought over this. Because you have spiritualism that is really atheistic in nature. Right? And then you have have Christianity, all different kinds of forms and all different kinds of religions um, that are now starting to stand up against wokeism, right? So, so there is this battle going on, and I'm not exactly sure how how to look at it, but all I know is that this king of the south and this king of the north have to be understood in a spiritual sense when we make an application to our time. That is, there's something the king of the north represents, and there's something the king of the south represents. And they can't be like Russia and the United States. They can't be Republicans and Democrats in this context. They can symbolize that in our line. Um, but I'm just saying on this bigger scale, this 
what is going to happen here is that you're going to have the king of the north and the king of the south and then the robbers of thy people. You're going to have the papacy, Rome. Now, these are all going to come together to form a threefold union in our time, which we see in Revelation. But the king of the south must represent the dragon power. The king of the north must represent the false prophet, which which is much more than just the United States, even though it, it is the United States, but it's apostate Protestantism. And they're at war with each other. But this war that they have against each other, it's going to be the papacy that comes in and unites these things, right? I mean, the United States is kind of the one that unites them. But but you understand what I'm saying? Hopefully. Any, anybody want to comment on that? That I think that we have had too narrow a focus of what raffia is. Yeah, it's uh, it's like uh, the way that I've come to understand uh, the way like uh, these wars are being fought. We find yeah. that uh, when yeah when the when NATO is uh, fighting a war, they are trying to put in uh, what themselves they call Christianity. When the Muslims, uh, the ISIS, they are fighting, they want to plant uh, Islam. Mm-hmm. That, yeah, yes, yes. On that level, that's how I normally like see it. It's more like uh, what is happening on, in Palestine, where we find that uh, they are they are trying to put in uh, a false religion. But uh, with them, they think like what they're doing is right, when in the actual sense it's not. Okay, well, I didn't catch everything you said, but I think I got the gist of, of what you're saying. So. So first we can say um, there's all these battles going. Like people want to look at what was happening in Ukraine is somehow connected with the king of the north and the king of the south fighting or or what's happening now in Israel, right? We're, we're trying to take these events of world his, history, these battles. And these battles, there's wars and rumors of wars. And these things are part of prophecy. But But here we have something that is bigger than these military battles, these religious battles. You know, you can look at all of these things that have been happening over the time that I've been in this message, right? Obviously ISIS. Uh, and, and people are trying to take these things and fit them into prophecy. But if we look at this much broader scale of what the king of the South is, atheism, and what the king of the North is, apostate Protestantism, there definitely is a battle being waged at the present time. And, and I'm not really sure how, you know, whether we, we could even say that we're in that battle of Rafi in some sense already. But um, I don't, and I don't know how it's going to unfold. But, but we're looking at a, um, an ideological battle going on in the world with with forces and powers, obviously p- things like the World Economic Forum, uh, the UN, they would represent this atheistic, secular worldview, this humanitarian, uh, humanistic worldview. And then you have the King of the North. This represents a more religious Christian view, Protestant you know, talking about Jesus and not Catholic, right? Because the Catholic Church is this other power. It's, you know, it's um, it's the beast, right? The beast that was and is not and yet is. So all of these powers come to play in these in these in this. It's chain in this time that we're living in, in these applications of Rafi and Panin. Right? And that's why when we get through this, when we looked at this yesterday, you know, you got the Battle of, of Rafi, chapter 11, right? He's going to take captives. So the, the king of the south takes captives, his ten thousands, right? Cast down many ten thousands. 
And then the king of the north returns. So this is apostate Protestantism. It's going to set forth a multitude greater than the former and shall certainly come after many years and a great army with a great army and much riches. And then it says in those times there shall stand up against the king. They shall stand. Many shall stand up against the king of the south. Now, when it says many, is that just the king of the north that stands up against the king of the south? No. no, if it were just the king of the north, it would say so. Yeah. so. That means the king of the north is going to come. There's going to be many that stand up against this belief, this philosophy. Also, the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the, the vision, right? And we know historically what this is. This is Rome. But in our time, the application of this must be the papacy. Right. Right. Yeah. So then in verse 15, so the king of of the north shall come, shall cast up a mount, take the most fenced cities and arms of the south shall not withstand. Neither is chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. But he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will. And none shall stand before him. This is the papacy. He shall stand in the glorious land which by his hand shall be consumed. This is Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, right? Right. So, so we can see that this is that final crisis that is represented by 40 to 45. And that is the Sunday law crisis. And it's going to be first the king of the south coming against the king of the north, pushing, and then the king of the north coming against him like a whirlwind. But we know that king of the north is the United States military power. It's the papacy as well. So the papacy is included in that, right? In, in that history. In the, but here we can see that it's the robbers of thy people, that that's going to be the papacy. So, so there's no way that we could look at these verses and not see Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. It's just describing that history it, in, in, in a previous history, but it's describing it very clearly. But if we're applying it to our time, we're taking Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, to our time, we don't have Daniel 11, uh, verse 40 to 45, just be about a conflict between the USA and uh, Russia, right? Or US, yeah, the USA and the Soviet Union, right? That's that's the time of the end. But the whole thing is about the Sunday, right? That's that's what it's all about. And so that's what this is about. And that's that's a worldwide scope. It's not it's not simply nation against nation. It's it's philosophy against philosophy. It's 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 more cosmic. In that, in that sense. Any more thoughts on this? I mean, I could be completely out to lunch on, on trying to look at it this way, but I don't see how I could look at it any other way. Now, so, you know, when William says it's World War Three. See, what we're looking at is we're looking at something that's just happening, right? Not something that we are a battle that we're a part of. Well, I would, I would say your, your way was the right way. I was just thinking that we talked about World War, that's all I was thinking. Yeah, I, I understand. But, but that's our natural tendency to look at these as military battles. Because it's described in a military battle. But we know when we get to Daniel 11, verse you know, 41 to 45, that he's not really talking about military battles there. It's talking about the Sunday law. It's talking about, 
you know, these forces of the world trying to persecute God's people and that there are people who are coming to the truth that are going to be saved, you know, from the different churches and um, that God's people are going to be able to stand and that there's going to be a close of probation. That close of probation is the close of probation for the world. Right? So, so we're looking at a history and, and we're familiar with the history. The history is not really an issue here for these verses, as far as I see. Uh, the issue is really how do we apply it to our lives? And I don't think we can take Daniel 11 and place it in a time on our lines that we, we can't do what we've done with the other ones. And we can take the symbols here and we can, we can put it back into our history and say, you know, we have the battle of Raphi and battle Paneum in our history and we can apply this again. But I think when we're looking at this, this is Daniel 11 verse 40 to 45. And it is a history that we can't, we can't know the time of that. We can't take a date and say, Raphia is going to be on this date and Paneum is going to be on this date. I don't believe God's going to give us that information. But maybe as we approach the time or as we pass the time, we'll see that there is something there. But all we can do with dates in the future is have symbolic dates. So I think that we could probably place some of this as symbolic dates as we go through and analyze the symbols here. Um, how would you think, so, and maybe it's hard to answer, but I'm just trying to think, what would that look like if it is going to be like a spiritual raffia? We're going to see mm. the King of the South is going to be some spiritual domination over some victory for atheism over Protestantism. Well, I think so, that's what we're, we're seeing the battle right now. And, and so I think, you know, we would like to just see wokeism just go away really quickly. But, but I think you're going to see, um, the, uh, the ideology, um, of wokeism expand. I don't think we're going to see what we would like to see. We'd like to see our freedom come back and, and so forth. And, and what's going to, it's going to be taken over by spiritualism, right? So however that's going to look, I don't know specifically, but this battle is going on right now. And, um, it's going to take captive, as it says, um, uh, they shall, uh, how does it go here? Uh, they shall take, he, and when he hath taken away the multitude, his heart shall be lifted up, and he shall cast down many ten thousands, but shall not be strengthened by it. So there's going to be a persecution that goes on, um, that comes from spiritualism. And, and we see that they're preparing for this war. Now, now, some people would place, you know, what's happened over the last few years into that context. This is sort of, that's why I'm saying that in some ways we could say that we're in the Battle of Raphia now. But I think, you know, you have, you ain't seen nothing yet of what's going to be happening in this world. Because you have to have such an extreme example of the King of the South for the King of the North to defeat it. So we can't be just looking at something like, Republicans defeating the Democrats in the next election as being Paneum. And that's all there is to it. Right? Because we're talking about the whole world and we're talking about these ideological systems. So the globalists have to defeat the King of the North. Not just in, you know, in some election, uh, you know, in the United States. 
But this can't be the Soviet Union or Russia in some kind of military battle. This has to be much more cosmic. But 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 in a sense we're in that right now, right? So so that's one of the reasons I don't think we can put a date on it. So to I, speak. I need to ask a question, Fred. Yeah. Why you call it cosmic? Why don't you just call it spiritualism? Well, there's different names you can give it. You know, I I, I like the word globalism. And communism, because they 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 give us something more concrete. Spiritualism is pretty abstract. I mean, that can mean a lot of different things. But I think uh, the vision that's that's given is is spiritualism has manifested itself in this communistic globalistic conspiracy, right? That they are seeking to take over the world and shape the world by you know depopulating it right they have all these fears about climate change all these different things that and 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 what they want to do is instead of letting things run their natural course and people make their own decisions they want to do it from the top down right they want to control this world from the top down but when the king of the north wins it's not going to be any different it's just going to be a different ideology controlling us in a different way. It's not going to be about the freedoms being returned to people, right? Because the king of the north in this context is apostate Protestantism. And and so the persecution will be just a different a different form. So anyway, we, we got to go, but uh, we'll come and look at this again tomorrow. We'll start to try to look at some of these symbols and and see what we can do with them. Okay, so let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study here uh, this morning. We know, Lord, that um, we are frail human beings. We don't understand everything. Um, we know that we are sinners and that we have unchristlike characters. And yet you have called us and have drawn us and are teaching us and leading us and developing a Christ-like character in us as we cooperate with you, the work of the Holy Spirit upon our hearts. And we pray for each person that you can watch over them, and that you can bring us together again to study your word according to thy will. And we pray this in Jesus' name.